that we can open up. Uh, first, uh, to echo John's comments about the, the community as a whole. Uh, born and raised in this area, and I, I fell in love with Northwest Connecticut all over again uh, through this experience, not just seeing um, uh, our, our residents from this area perform here uh, every day in meeting the need, uh, but the, uh, the outpouring, whether it was just gestures of support, um, uh, food, uh, well wishes, um, uh, supplies uh, from, uh, from throughout the Northwest corner, uh, really uh, was a shared, shared value throughout this whole thing and uh, uh, just uh, forever uh, uh, impression that was left for, for, for myself. Um, so uh, John did mention and our hospitalizations are down uh, throughout this experience to date. Uh, over 160 uh, individuals did turn to us, uh, were hospitalized, uh, and we did see uh, a real uh, ugly side of this virus, certainly. Uh, it's a very humbling uh, virus to see it from this perspective, um, uh, but uh, we, uh, we did rise to the occasion and we'll continue to stay ready. Uh, I'm just adding on the testing, other than the fixed site, uh, we have started some mobile testing as well. Uh, we've had three so far, and we have our fourth set up in North Canaan next week, uh, July, July 15th. Uh, target populations there are North Canaan and Nor Norfolk. Um, we've put the word out, and we're at about just over 50 uh, people in the last uh, 48 hours have called uh, for that mobile testing. Uh, we are emphasizing going forward our fixed station, uh, and uh, we're here uh, eight to four, six days a week, uh, and want to want to uh, meet as much community need as we can in that fixed station. The mobile stations will be hard to maintain for the long haul, uh, but if there is a particular need, uh, please let us know. I'm looking at Goshen right now on the back of Bob there, and that's. Uh, Oceans never looked better, so I don't, I don't know. They may be having a totally different experience uh, than others, but, but we're a uh, we're phone call away, uh, uh, please, on, on, on the testing front. And then lastly, uh, just three projects we wanted to give you a quick update on. Uh, one, uh, we came to you uh, several, uh, several weeks back about uh, an application for uh, paramedic service, uh, expanding paramedic service. Uh, we did get caught up uh, in the in the COVID. That application process has been uh, put out now three times uh, calendar-wise. It is not scheduled. Yet. Uh, so um, uh, it's regrettable, uh, but we wanted to bring that news to you and make sure that uh, you understood that our commitment remains the same, uh, but the timetable has changed. And a couple other uh, initiatives, our Winstead uh, uh, Health Center uh, building is continuing. We're hoping to occupy that uh, by the uh, late fall, uh, early winter. So probably around the November timeframe, our hope is before Thanksgiving, we're there and operational. Uh, we were able to continue that construction through the, through the pandemic. And then lastly, we have a, an exciting initiative. We're building an infusion center uh, here at uh, the Charlotte Hungerford main campus. So a dedicated on oncological infusion center. We'll also do other types of infusions there and medical oncology space. And that's a, a part of the Hartford Healthcare Cancer Institute. So we're really excited about that. We hope to be complete right around uh, October 1 and be live. So those are the highlights we wanted to hit. Don, we're oh, uh, available for any, uh, any questions anybody might have. And appreciate this time. Thank you guys. I know you've been working a lot of hours and putting out a lot of fires along the way. Are there any questions for the folks from Charlotte Hungerford? I guess you did a good job presenting. Okay. Thanks Thank, so thank much. you very much. Right. Do Bye -bye. we have anybody else uh, as part of the public presentation? Rick, were you able to get all the Rob Rubo? Um, I did uh, reach Rob uh, yesterday. He had a prior commitment, so he's not able to join us today, Don. All right. Um, so if there's nobody else, let's go through the town by town updates. You know, you want to do a roll call on that? Don. All right. I'm uh, sorry. It, can you hear me? It's Hetty Ayers with Eversource. Oh, Hetty, you want to? I can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I'm so sorry. I was on mute and I started to talk. My apologies. 
Just a really quick update if I can. I'm joined with by Steve Silver and Kevin Wickos and just wanted to let folks know that as of yesterday, we were notified that our in-person energy efficiency services um, are, are back in effect. Um, we'll be using enhanced safety guidelines for residential customers and businesses. As you know, we were offering virtual energy efficiency services for our customers during the pandemic, and those virtual options will still remain um, for those who are not yet comfortable with an in-person visit. Um, in addition, we also are offering some increased incentives on the energy efficiency front um, with a range of offerings uh, covering residential, small business, municipal, and commercial and industrial customers. These increased incentives are only available for a very limited time. Many of them are actually expiring in August, so we encourage folks to check them out in the short term so they don't miss out. Um, more information is available at Eversource.com, and we do have a copy of a press release that was issued yesterday that we can certainly forward to the communities as well. If you would forward that to Rick and have Rick send it to everybody, that would be good. Happy to. Thank you. Anyone else? Don, it's Jean. Um, yesterday on the Gov call, they asked towns who were um, asking questions to sort of give an update on how social distancing, the you know all the um, the three big NPIs were going as far as continuing to to keep our numbers low. And I was wondering if, as we go through the town by town, folks could touch on that as part of their report. The numbers or whether they're seeing problems in town? Um, how, yeah, whether they're seeing problems, how, um, you know, how, how the public is going as far as, you know, as we continue to head through this. I'm moving on. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, you know, the thing they did ask yesterday was a, whether you were seeing problems with crowd social distancing, masks, et cetera. So yeah, we can do that. The other thing we wanted to focus on in the town by town is where things stand with recreation, senior center, town halls, if there's anything new and different. So I think that's probably, you know, we can add certainly um, town statistics to that. And I know Bob Valentine asked yesterday again about events like fairs and outdoor gatherings but so when you know why don't we do a roll call of people who are here alphabetically perfect let's do that and just to let everyone know the default is that everyone is muted so if you are anticipating speaking just unmute yourself i'll try to help as well but going through we can start from the top with bark hampstead okay um so the senior center was anxious to get going right now they have a uh barbecue scheduled for the end of August to celebrate their 20th year in the current senior center. And that will obviously depend on what happens with the data, but they understand that they, we really can't reopen the senior center until we know things have settled down. Uh, town hall is still closed to the public. Most everybody is back working. Uh, we have doorbells and people don't seem to mind too much. They're doing a lot of online, particularly the Tax collector tells me she's never seen so many people paying their taxes online. If there is a transaction that needs to be done in person, we're meeting people outside. And to be honest, I haven't gotten any complaints about not having town hall generally open to the public. Um, or Campstead Reservoir or the dam, the MDC is still not op reopened the dam to the public. They are not going to open their swimming areas this year. Uh, they are going to allow uh, canoes and kayaks from their boat launch and our town beach on Lake McDonough is open but without boating and that seems to be working out pretty well and the biggest problems we've had which was echoed by a lot of people on the phone call yesterday is that the state forests are just overwhelmed with visitors now that they put the picnic tables back out and they're allowing groups to picnic but we had I will boat launch on West Hill Pond. There was just absolutely overwhelmed. People's forest was overwhelmed. So we think the general public is very anxious to get out and have recreation. But in general, I think in our numbers, we've had uh, one or two new cases over the last few weeks, but it's been pretty quiet for the last month, month and a half. That's my report, Janelle. Okay. So next, Burlington. Hi. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Good to see everybody. 
Um, uh, Don's report's very similar to mine. Uh, town hall closed to the public, but open for appointments. Um, and we are doing tax collection that's going well. We had a very unique situation. Our tax collector's uh, office is close to our front door. So our public works installed a sliding window. Um, so folks can walk up. It's kind of like a Dairy Queen situation where you can walk up. And um, we took all the precautions and um, so far so good. So therefore folks are not coming into town hall, but they have a opportunity to interact um, safely with our tax collector. So I'll, I'll report on that next time to see how it goes, uh, how it's going. Um, our library remains closed. We're doing curbside uh, drop off and pick up. Parks and recreation, our parks are open, um, but limited in a sense in terms of social distancing and uh, groups, no larger than certain these uh, guides, guidance. Uh, our organized sports, uh, like sport, uh, junior sports leagues, our little league is having a modified, um, modified games uh, in terms of safety. Summer camps are, we do are doing a summer camp, again, modified under the guidelines. Our senior center remains closed. Um, our food pantry remains closed to the public, except we do it by appointment. And we've been doing um, uh, every two weeks, we have a outdoor distribution. They're in their vehicles. We have it organized. It's kind of, uh, and we tie it into our regional food share. Um, the last piece is probably uh, region 10, the school system. Um, I've been asked, uh, Mike Chris has been asked to sit on a um, steering committee of about 30, educators and administrators to try to figure out what opening could look like um, in several weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Henry Todd Kanan. Okay, I've unmuted myself. Uh, town hall is closed. Uh, we do allow people in for appointments when we have a tricky uh, search or something that needs to be done one person at a time. Uh, senior Center remains uh, closed. Uh, that's mainly at the request of the seniors. They don't want to get back. Uh, they are communicate uh, with each other through the iPads that we've uh, provided all the regular visitors so that they're on FaceTime with their friends, which has helped a lot. Uh, our recreation facilities, we had a little, uh, I think Curtis talked more about the little brouhaha at the, uh, or uh, an incident in Satanic River. Um, I'll let Curtis talk about that because it's mostly on uh, his side and, um, you know, what more can I say? Uh, uh, other than that, uh, everybody is uh, doing pretty well in our town. We're not having any real problems. Uh, and uh, we have the uh, Charlotte, Hunger, Heart, Char Charlotte Hungerford Hospital uh, came over and did uh, testing in our town. They tested, I don't know, 65 people. There were no positives, which was good. And uh, Life goes on. Uh, town hall remains closed. Uh, I guess I I guess I already said that. Okay, nothing else. All right. Great. Um, next up, we have Cornwall, Gordon Ridgeway. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, our town hall is also. Uh, closed. Uh, we're doing a lot of remote work. And what's really interesting, I think, is also there's a lot of people here who are also learning how to remotely work themselves. So everybody is having a bit of a lifestyle change. And I remember the expression of making a lemonade out of lemons. And I think that's what we're trying to do. And instead of looking at this as, as a impossible crisis, I think this is going to be with us for quite a while. Uh, 
And so looking how we can retool our town, not just in town hall operations, but also um, in regulations as a whole to accommodate more at home businesses, more people working remotely. And Janelle is, is actually doing a very good job uh, redoing our planning and zoning regulations now, not just because of COVID, but to bring them up into the 21st century. Uh, so that's ongoing, pretty exciting. We're going to try to redo some uh, projects that we had in the pipeline uh, that we sort of put on hold. We're going to see how we can do those and make decisions as a town in this new environment so we don't get, um, <clears throat> you know, bogged down anymore by the crisis. Uh, we're lucky to have a great volunteer corps that is uh, delivering uh, food necessities to people that are homebound and can't get the food pensions and whatever else. So we are adjusting, but uh, again, I think people are cooperating really well. We've got our beach set up uh, for social distancing and things. Uh, still concerned about uh, uh, when people come here to for recreation, uh, that it's all like the Wild West out there. So uh, we are working with HDA and with DEP trying to get uh, uh, more monitoring, more assistance to people that may be uh, visiting here to try to make the day as safe as possible. So again, uh, we're uh, trying to make uh, making some lemonade. So have a good summer. Thanks. Great. Bob Valentine, Goshen. Okay, so <clears throat> as you can see, because we're on top of the hill, we have good breezes and little water lapping the beaches and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, Goshen has um, been faring pretty well. Um, we did have uh, for our seniors a drive through a senior picnic, which was very successful and very appreciated by our seniors. Our library is open by appointment at, as we speak. Uh, four individuals can come in at a time with half hour uh, time slots. And that seems to be working out well. Uh, town hall, although we've not made any announcement, um, we are allowing people into town hall at this point. Uh, people are, as others have said, taking advantage of our electronic means for doing much of our business, but there are people who are coming in. We've put together strict protocol so that anyone coming in gets, uh, has to do temperature check, sign in, uh, use hand sanitizers, wear a mask, and then we sanitize regularly uh, town hall. Uh, we've installed Dutch doors, uh, Dutch style doors on our assessor's off our uh, town clerk's space so that no one can go into the to the vault, uh, but with the town clerk's approval, sneeze guards there as well, so no more than two people in the vault at a time. Um, tax collector's door has a Dutch style door so no one goes in there in a fiscal office. Um, so that seems to be working out well. Um, some of you might have heard we had a town meeting last Tuesday. We needed to elect a Board of Ed member and also had a Highlands grant that we needed to dispose of, allow us to put an easement on a parcel of land and receive a grant and put it into our land preservation fund. We use some of the same protocols. We put, we had the meeting in the Goshen Center School cafeteria, uh, not cafeteria, but gymnasium. Uh, we placed chairs six plus feet apart um, checked people in, made them wear a mask, checked their temperature. Um, I would say it was very successful. People were very respectful because it was a gymnasium. There's exhaust fans we were able to turn on, opened up all the doors. So that worked out well. We had 63 individuals show up, and now we have a Board of Ed member who uh, represents Goshen, where we had a vacancy for four months, not able to have any meeting at all prior to that. Recreation is running a summer camp. Uh, we're under new protocol from the Office of Early Childhood Services. Um, those protocol, although changed substantially how we're doing camp, uh, are working out and many of the parents are extremely happy that we are having um, the summer camp. And so we're pleased to be able to do that. Uh, the Goshen Cornwall Senior Bus continues to run, uh, although we are uh, having put in next week because it, it wasn't busy at all and now it's starting to get busier. Uh, some sneeze guards and things within the senior bus. Um, Gordon and I just talked about that. 
Um, but all in all, we're muddling through and trying to put protocols in and um, just pleased that we are where we are currently as Charlotte talked about COVID cases and what we have here in Litchfield County. So that's it. And I apologize, I skipped over Colebrook. I see Tom, there you are. Hi, how are you? Uh, Sorry. Our town hall is closed, uh, like everyone else, with, with appointment only. Uh, we're still uh, doing the restoration from the damage. Uh, hopefully next week, uh, I'm clerk, my office and my assistant's offices, the furniture will be in the beginning of the week and they can start moving everything into those offices. And then after the primary, there's three more offices that they have to uh, move all the furniture out and redo the floors and paint the walls. Uh, our pond area is open uh, and it's working out fine. The people seem to be just uh, social distancing by themselves. It's worked out extremely well. Uh, Senior Center has closed all activities, and uh, Camp Jewel and Tom has uh, canceled everything for the whole summer. They were going to try to do uh, um, day camps, but they've uh, canceled that, and uh, so they've closed for the summer. That's about it. Thank you. Um, Heartland, Maggie. Good morning. Our town buildings are still closed by appointment. Um, that's including our library and our rental buildings and the fire departments. Uh, we're collecting taxes outside. We have a little pathway that we built, goes right to a sliding window at the tax collection right in front of our building. It's really worked well. I'm happy about that. We also have a drop box just in case. We have about four drop boxes, library, the lions, the taxes, and now we're getting ready for the, the town clerk's ballots. Um, that's been a challenge because nobody puts anything in the right box. Uh, we've been working with the school towards reopening. I guess their plan is due on the 24th. That's mind boggling. We're still pretty cautious at our ponds. The West Hartwood, which we have the right of way, that's been a challenge. We've had the police there just about every day. We have shortened hours. We use the DEP rules. People really aren't paying too much attention. Our other pond is a lot bigger. Um, and I will tell you, we're putting in a pier in Wade's honor. And we're also going to reclaim the beach on the other side of the pond, and that'll be Wade's Beach. So we're really kind of excited about that. Um, we are wondering about what you're doing for the kids' recreation, the sports the, in the field. Last night we had 30 kids there. Um, I hadn't opened the field, so it was a surprise to me. But I'm getting a lot of pushback saying Simsbury's doing their sports, Granby's doing their sports, Enfield, and such. So I said, you know, I'll kind of poll and see what we're doing with this. It, it concerns me a little bit, and I would assume we'd have to log who's there, how many people, um, and go from there, because if there was a problem, I can't imagine you, you wouldn't be able to track it. Uh, so that's been a big problem. Our food bank and welfare is by appointment. Normally, we take an order and we deliver it. Um, I have been processing pistol permits like crazy. So I meet them in the lobby and I take all the added information, you know, and we go from there. But that's been pretty constant, making us a little bit of money in town. Uh, we're getting ready for our school primary. We're going to have that in a different location because town hall is just too small. We'll do that in the school and then worrying about the deep clean afterwards. Um, that's pretty much for us. We're about the same still. Uh, people seem to be okay. We've been pretty functional all along. Not too many complaints. Thank you. Harwinton, Michael, Chris. I saw him earlier. Um, we'll skip him and come back. Um, Litchfield, Denise. I don't know if you wanted to go to Kent first. Jean, how are you? Oh, I see. Yeah, we could do that. I'm skipping all around. We can go to Kent. We'll come back to you, Denise. Thanks. You're so lovely, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> I always know I'm right after you. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks. Good morning. Um, it's so nice to see everybody's faces. I'm just going sort of through the same 
list as everybody else. Um, our senior center remains closed. Our town hall remains closed. We have some, um, if people really need to come and have an in-person appointment, then we're using the large meeting room and that gets um, cleaned afterwards. Um, our uh, recreation is, is definitely um, down for the year. We were not able to do a day camp because of how the sort of the lay of the land of Emory Park and the availability of the kids to socially distance and um, it just wasn't going to work out. So it's unfortunate. Um, the We did do a recent concert series, uh, started a recent concert series we have, uh, have had in the past one and they moved it to a drive-in and we had the, la the first one last Thursday night and while it was exciting because it filled up to the 50 cars that we averaged for the um, guidance, the sector guidance. Um, once everybody got in there, we were asking everybody to just stay in their car. They could have the doors open, close, air conditioning on. We put a full space in between each person, in, I'm sorry, in between each car. It was really well laid out, um, but people just started getting out of their cars and putting their chairs outside. And so it was an enormous amount of, um, compliance and trying to enforce those rules and it and it it was not um not successful in enforcing those rules so we've suspended the series for the moment to try to figure out if we can actually pull it off with the the amount of volunteers or folks that we're going to need to do that compliance so that's frustrating and unfortunate because it was very very well received um they are they're also doing a little league over in southbury and um our director reported that the kids were all doing what they were supposed to be doing, wearing masks, social distancing, but some of the grown-ups weren't. So um, she's going to have a conversation with her, the fellow park and rec directors to try to get some more compliance out of the, the parents and the um, coaches and stuff. Uh, social services, our food bank has remained open throughout. Uh, they modified, they went to a drive-through um, process very early on and that has been hugely successful. She's seen a um, doubling in her numbers of families and folks that she's um, providing services to. And if um, folks are not um, wanting to leave their homes, they're also doing delivery to a, a small number of um, users of the food bank. So that has been a, a big success and it's a huge, huge labor burden for our social services director. Um, and I have to give a shout out to the Food Hub folks because we're getting a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables from the Food Hub, which is obviously you want that. Um, I think I mentioned our senior center is closed. Meals on Wheels continues. Um, we're, we're doing a pilot program or ramping up for a pilot program to uh, start to move some of our basic permitting stuff online. Like um, we're starting with the transfer station permit so that it's a fully um, electronic process, there's no paper involved, and we're hoping to get that up in the next few weeks. And then that will hopefully lead to a lot of other, of those simple services like dog licenses and stuff getting going online. Um, and under miscellaneous, um, Kent Falls Park stays, is remaining closed, which is frustrating, but we're in regular contact with Commissioner Dykes and she's trying to figure out a way to get it open, but it just the lay of that land doesn't work. Um, we have also seen a very large uptick in pistol permit um, applications as well. And Bulls Bridge has been the um, thorn bush in my side for 15 weeks now. Uh, the National Park Service finally, um, not finally, they came to us and were really, really concerned about what was going down on down on the riverfront. And uh, last weekend, yeah, just in time for Fourth of July. Um, it was the entire area has been closed so I apologize Salisbury and Canaan because we're probably pushing some of those folks up to you um, it was it was it's been really really tough the the land has been destroyed there's garbage that um, our task force had to you know pick up every day and also the task force was harassed pretty badly by some groups of folks who were wanting to use misuse the area, even though there's rules posted everywhere and this task force is 
great about communicating the same message to everybody. They've been doing it for eight years. Um, so that was the point, that was really the tipping point because we had these four or five volunteers who were really working as a sort of light enforcement um, and now they're not there. So there was just no way the area could be monitored. So um, National Parks within four or five days, um, which was amazing, they had 150 signs printed, bilingual signs printed, um, shipped up here. They had a small team that went out and put up the signs and put up like three different layers of snow fencing along this little trail that leads to the riverfront. So they did a really good job to tighten that down down there. But our, our resident state trooper spends an enormous amount of time still monitoring and enforcing down there. But at least he has the tool now to, to better and more easily enforce. But it's um, busy and our North Kent Road is continuing to ramp up as far as people sneaking in and they move the barrier, they put the barrier back and they go down and they use the short little shore there and uh, leave lots and lots of garbage. So it's been frustrating. That's all, thanks. Litchfield. Uh, Litchfield, we uh, are dealing with a lot of the same concerns everybody else is dealing with. Our town hall is um, open only by appointment, but we do have a lot of people continuing to pull out the back door. So there is some frustration from, um, let's say the tax collector and the tax assessor that they have to constantly, cause that's where their offices are close to. They can hear the people knocking, even though we have signage on the back. Um, so we're discussing um, how we can maybe reopen safely uh, to some certain departments. The, the town clerk, because she's overwhelmed right now with all the absentee um, applications coming in, um, she prefers that we do stay closed and keep it uh, tighter. And, and I think I'm in agreement with that because it's been working and uh, maybe we just need better signage in the back so people will, will read it. Um, the tax collector also has a slide window with a door buzzer so that when they ring the bell to pay their taxes, um, she can do that safely through the back of the building. Um, our town beach, uh, also has had problems with uh, visitors not having uh, town permits and um, garbage and parties and I unfortunately did not have we don't have somebody in town that um, watches that park on the weekends or anytime actually so what I've done because the uh, park and rec coordinator um, really hasn't had a lot to do lately because we don't have a camp this summer um, I've redeployed him to uh, take over the, that, that park Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays to make sure that our residents are being able to use the park and the boat launch. He's also taken on the responsibility of driving our senior bus uh, two days a week. So we've gotten that back from Northwest Transit and it's very popular and it's a 12 passenger bus, but uh, we're only allowing four people on it. And he actually is enclosed in, in with plexiglass. So um, he feels safe and everybody's really appreciative of, of having the bus available. Um, the Litchfield Community Center, um, although it's a private nonprofit, um, they are open only outside, not inside. They have a tent for the entire summer and offering uh, programs and classes outside and people seem to be really happy that they're offering that. And um, concerts, uh, we are hoping uh, to Reestablish our Wednesday concert starting July 29th. Uh, this afternoon, um, some of the commission members from Park and Rec are going to the uh, borough to get permission to use our community field. And I did talk to Doug Delana this morning to make sure that we're still allowed to have, um, it, the, the, as of July 3rd, it said up to 500 people on blankets, 15 feet apart. Um, after Jean spoke, I'm a little more concerned that um, people may not um, stay on their blankets, but um, I think we're going to try to uh, think have three or four concerts and we'll start that July 29th. So we're hoping that um, that can work out because people really are looking forward to something to do in our town. And um, lastly, we're just, we continue to do Zoom meetings. We've done Zoom public meetings. I'm pretty much the host on every meeting. So anything anybody wants to know about anything going on in our town, I can certainly uh, let them know. Um, I was happy to, to uh, uh, be part of the meeting last night where we did pass the solar project through inland wetlands and next week we have to go through planning and zoning but I'm 
um, hopeful that uh, everybody feels comfortable that they've had a say in the public hearings uh, via either virtual meeting or we've allowed them to email and allowed them to use snail mail. So um, that's about it. Great, thank you. Morris. Yeah, we've had our uh, curbside food bank uh, five days a week since the beginning of this. Uh, senior center is closed, but we will start having some outdoor events for the seniors. Town hall is open by appointment. We do, a, do have a doorbell and we meet the people at the door. The uh, town beach has been open. We had a concert down there about a week and a half ago, and we're going to have another concert on our town green. Uh, oh, it was supposed to be this Friday night. Not sure if it's going to happen. Library is open with limitations. We did have a town meeting to elect a board of ed member. Uh, we had eight attendees, and it lasted a full two minutes. It was the best town meeting in a long time. And. Uh, one issue with social distancing we did have uh, is this past weekend uh, on Bantam Lake in North Bay, there was a large uh, kind of gathering, a party with a uh, floating DJ out there. And there was a pretty good sized group of young people that were in the water, hanging out very close and uh, no mass for that. But not much we could do about it. The DEP is in charge of uh, the state waters on Bantam Lake. And uh, that's about it. New Hartford. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hi. Um, we're doing well here in New Hartford. Um, our town hall has been open for the better part of two or three weeks now. Uh, we've uh, instituted a get in, get out policy, and we're, we're really not advertising that we're open. The in-person uh, attendance at town hall is far lower. People are still you know, kind of now been retrained into the, um, you know, use of email and, and phone or snail mail. But for those people come in, the doors are unlocked and uh, right on the door, it says, get in, do your business and get out. You know, so we don't have the usual socialization that we used to have, uh, which is great. Uh, the one portion of the town hall that really isn't up to speed, like everybody else is the senior center, We've, our senior bus has been running all the way through. Granted, we put um, limitations on how many people at the peak of the COVID. We were only one person on the bus at a time, and then we went to two uh, for our 12-seater bus. But we've got a great bus driver, and it's been working. We've been doing virtual exercise through Zoom. With We have some freelancers that uh, provide that service for us. They've been getting some good results uh, with that, a lot of uh, newsletters and correspondence and outreach to our seniors and of course uh, you know we have our senior director doing virtual coffee hours and things like that just trying to keep people engaged our parks are up and running we had our second concert last night we do a wednesday concert series like a lot of other towns uh, really really uh, proud of the compliance of course we have the type of facility that really lends itself we have a huge field at Brody Park so to put a hundred people or 150 people there on four acres plus or minus people can all socially distance heavy police presence to make sure and the people like the police there we also run our town beach there we opened our beach on June 1st and uh, limited it to in-town sales for two weeks uh, I think we just sold our 575th beach pass so for a town of our size, that's pretty good numbers. And believe it or not, a full one third of them went to seniors. So when you talk about the conflicting data or concern about at risk, um, I thought that that was a higher than normal uh, percentage of sales going to someone that I thought might not necessarily come out and buy tickets, but, but it did work out. So uh, again, a lot of police there, um, a, we had a transition in our uh, parks department. We bought in a guy uh, who has a lot of experience, a career recreation guy uh, who has been a daily presence there. And just, you know, we have kids that are our lifeguards and camp counselors, and we are running a day camp also. Uh, we're in week two, um, but having the adult supervision there who's not afraid in any way, shape or form to ask for police help, 
uh, to make sure that people are abiding by the rules, respecting the passes and keeping social distance uh, has been great. The day camp, on the other hand, we find that with the restrictions in place, the sales have been nowhere near uh, what we would be typically used to. We're in our second week. Uh, I think I ran the numbers last night for my rec commission. You know, we, we are probably, you know, just under 40, just under 40 kids attending in what typically would be 150. So, you know, we have to uh, be nimble and obviously because you have a certain amount of mobilization to ramp up. We have um, camp counselors that are with us for a period of years. You don't want to lose them because they have the experience of knowing the program. And yet we have to right size the program so that we have the money to pay these kids and take care of business. Um, unusual things, uh, just like uh, Gene was saying down in Kent, are um, state run or leased. Um, Satan's Kingdom Two Bride was closed by DEP. The uh, vendor who runs it didn't want to mobilize this summer, which has had impacts in moving people that would typically go there for recreation, along with the MDC beaches on Lake McDonough, are seeking other things. So our river has been busy. Our uh, first responder, responders are really concerned about that because several areas of the river are very difficult to access. So there has been some meetings. Um, and uh, I've discussed this with the first selectman in Canton, just a difficult situation. This is not, you know, we're all about safe recreation and some of those areas are very hard to access for our firefighters that do these water rescues. And when Satan's Kingdom Too Bright is up and running, they have lifeguards all the way stationed down the river uh, that aid in those rescues. And right now they're not there. So we're, we're seeing some level of concern that this could be a, a difficult summer for the, our folks who, uh, are the first ones on scene because they don't know, they don't have the eyes on that they normally have and the help in the river to guide them. So, uh, you know, other, you know, our numbers uh, remain relatively low for the, the last couple of months. So we're happy about that. You know, it's, um, our, our struggle now is we are starting to open up town hall to in-person meetings, but we want to be um, compliant and uh, with the FOI so we're trying to uh, move to a hybrid of this Zoom format where we can have our commissions in the room. I, I really dislike this format because it doesn't allow you that one-on-one -on -one relationship and to be able to see your other commissioners or board members and, and have a, I feel, a better dialogue with them. But yet we want to go to a, a streamed format where people that are concerned that still do not want to attend in-person meetings can still attend virtually. So we're trying to segue our Zoom meetings into a hybrid format where um, boards and commissions like our land use boards can get back together and yet people can still uh, come in and log on online and participate so that you know everybody's uh, rights to participate are respected. So that's our next challenge and that's what we're working on. Okay, Janelle, we're almost a half hour behind. So if the, I don't know how many more people have to go, but if we can try to shorten each town just a little bit. Sounds good. Norfolk. Yeah, things are going well in Norfolk. We're, um, as everyone else, we're, uh, our town hall is limited. We, have, we do have a beach that's open using all of the guidelines by the state of Connecticut. Uh, we are trying to have some programs for our seniors as well as um, others, but we have no youth sports going on. Um, it's, it is business as usual in Norfolk right now. We have some sewer lines being done. Our, um, we're having a water main put in. So it's very difficult um, getting around to, around town. Uh, I do want to thank a couple of people. Steve Silver for uh, taking care of some issues I had with some tree work. Thanks, Steve. And um, Kevin Whitco came out last week because I don't know if anyone else has witnessed this, but there has been an increase of speeding since this whole thing started. And um, Kevin came out uh, last week to meet with myself and uh, one of our residents, as well as Maria Horn, to discuss what they could do and how they could interface with the uh, uh, DOT commissioner to try to do something. But other than that, uh, things are going well. And, um, you know, like everybody, we all want to, we all, all want to get back to normal. That's it. Great. Thank you.
North Canaan. Good morning. Uh, everything is going very well in North Canaan. We're still locked down at the town hall. We did install a doorbell uh, so the people come in so they can start paying some people that want to pay their taxes uh, on that. Our tax collector is setting up a table outside under a pop-up tent on the nice sunny days to uh, do collection out there because some people still like to come in the old-fashioned way to pay their bill in cash or get a receipt from a check. Um, Everything else seems to be to go good. Uh, we opened up our one playground that we do have in town. Uh, that's been going over good with some kids as long as they keep it clean. Uh, we did put signs up so it's under their own responsibility. Our pool is hoping to end up, start in the last week of July. Uh, maybe at least get a month out of it. There won't be many people sitting around it, but it's, at least they'll get open. Uh, on a couple of good notes, uh, we are starting the construction finally after 20 years in the center of town upgrade to railroad crossing, um, so which is good news. So when you come bopping through the center of town, you don't bottom out by Roma Pizza. They're going to be putting gates. Had five applicants for zoning enforcement. We have a couple of interviews. Hopefully, we can pick a new person to get a zoning enforcement officer for the town of North Canaan. And yeah. You know, why don't we move to the next one and come back if his My internet returns? Uh, besides that, going there you go. And go. Great. Salisbury? We're doing fine, Janelle. <laughs> um, as Henry mentioned, we had, uh, we had a little fracas down there at uh, Great Falls, and I'm sure that's not the last time. Um, it's a pretty much out of control situation. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, they have to provide some access to the river by FERC. Uh, regulations and they have a, a canoe pull out up above the falls so that access has to stay open um, so we're working on that and hopefully HVA and uh, First Light and Henry and I and whoever else can get together come up with some kind of a management plan um, town halls shut uh, months ago we put a slot in and opened the foyer and everything's being done in the entrance to the town hall, it's worked real well. Uh, people can come in, our beach is open. Uh, we're limiting to 200 residents. We took out the big rafts. Um, and uh, so anyway, we're, we're working out, everything's fine. I did wanna know, Don, when do you wanna mention um, the hazardous waste or Rick? Rick said that we have to vote on that for the contracts so away. Yeah, ahead. I'll just give you a heads up. Um, when I before I leave, we're we're um, we're thinking that we shouldn't try to do this hazardous waste in August. Uh, yeah, um, COVID doesn't, doesn't seem to be right. getting any less virulent, and we're afraid things are going to move up here. Uh, hard to find volunteers who want to man that for a half a day. Um, so there seems to be some consensus that this might be the year to delay, and we wouldn't know about. Torrington in October, but at least August, we are pretty much in the RAC committee decided that we should postpone to next year. And that's all I have. Great, thanks. Sharon? We're all good, Sharon. Everything's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're moving along, just uh, trying to navigate this. Uh, we're staying closed for now. The drop box out back has helped and uh, we put our forms outside as well. We have have an opportunity to have meetings in person. Sometimes they're in the parking lot, sometimes they're upstairs. And uh, so, um, you know, slowly getting back to normal and just really, I think um, most of the day is spent calming people down because um, a lot of people feel differently about this whole situation. And it's just a matter of having those conversations and, and, and you know, making them feel that um, their voice is, is heard and, and helping them any way we can. So, um, no, we got a lot of different things going on all at once every day, just like you guys. And, um, you know, hopefully um, 
things get better soon. And um, the one thing we did add, if you guys are having beaver problems, we added this beaver deceiver and two locations in town. And it's basically a caging and a piping system that confuses the beaver because they don't feel the, the water rushing towards the culvert and they've worked perfectly. The price was affordable. And so if anyone needs information about it, I'm happy to uh, show you the locations and tell you all about it. That's good for me. Thanks. Great. Um, Torrington. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't think that I can share anything that hasn't already been shared by all the other um, municipalities. Um, I'll only update um, you in regard to the city's Board of Education pursuing um, school construction this year. So there will be a referendum coming up in the fall. Um, other than that, we're facing the exact same problems everybody else is and some of the same wins. So good work on everybody's part. Thank you, Mayor. Warren. Okay, there we go. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, thanks for letting me talk here for a couple minutes. Uh, definitely experiencing every, most everything that you guys are all and gals are going through. Um, I found it as a newly elected very helpful to be fortunate enough to learn from what everybody else is doing and try to implement uh, things appropriately from that. Um, you know, the beach concerts, all that stuff has been talked about. Um, so the one thing that I found it I'm having issues with is we have a building boom in town. I don't know how many other towns are experiencing that, but our, we're very busy with our land use. Uh, at the same time, we're struggling with uh, securing somebody for the job. Uh, I was, I talked to uh, a number of uh, you folks at, at the Northwest COG to try to brainstorm that as far as sharing a position with somebody else, uh, another town. Um, and I think that for the future, is going to be important uh, in order to provide a package where somebody will feel comfortable staying uh, with having insurance uh, and not having one town bear the burden of that. I know it's not a new concept, but um, I think it's something yeah. that we're going to have to really think about. Um, but uh, we are struggling with that. So that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Washington. Jim. We'll skip um, Bob Winchester. Okay, uh, Winchester Town Halls. Uh, we did a uh, unannounced opening week before last. We, we're at the week we sent out the tax bills, so we have a uh, the, the signage on the door says no mask, no service. Uh, we've only had one minor incident where there was a mask refusal. We dealt with that. People are generally complying. Senior Center is closed. The Rec Department is is moving forward with very limited activities. Uh, uh, our biggest issue is our lake, Highland Lake. Uh, we've got two beaches. So far, we've restricted ac access. That seems to be working pretty well. Our problem is there are 700 boats registered to that lake. Uh, it's also a pontooned airplane landing strip, which hasn't helped anything. Uh, the state you know, controls the water. We control the land. There's continuing issues about uh, uh, about access to various parts of the lake that aren't controlled by the town, but the state the, the state is working with us. Uh, Connecticut Health and Wellness has provided uh, some pop-up testing. We've got two more scheduled. They did 82 tests last week on one day. They were all negative. Uh, by and large, we're, uh, we're dealing. That's it. Okay. Great, thanks. Well, good thing we got extra time on the agenda because it looks like we're only 35 minutes behind. Uh, but the next one up, uh, Eric Obrey, uh, talk about sheltering resources in the Northwest Hills from the Red Cross. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you that I have not met yet, my name is Eric Wu, and I am the Senior Director for the American Red Cross for Region 5. So I cover this, uh, the same territory as John Field uh, for the Red Cross. And what I really wanted to come today to talk about was obviously Everybody's dealing with the COVID environment. 
Um, as we are moving into what is to be expected a busy uh, tropical storm hurricane wildfire season, I uh, just kind of wanted to talk about that and what sheltering looks like for expectations from the Red Cross to Region 5. Currently in, um, in Litchfield County, um, our sheltering capacity only lies currently in the city of Torrington. That is the only town that has a regional shelter. And that capacity went from 500 pre-landfall uh, and 252 post-landfall to 168 and 91 post-landfall. The, the spacing requirements um, are now 60 foot pre-landfall and 110 square foot per person post-landfall. So uh, there are some conversations and there will be some conversations next week uh, with the town of Kent uh, to see if we can identify an additional regional shelters to support Litchfield County. Um, I don't think uh, our region, our region five is not in a hurricane evacuation area. Therefore, I don't expect the need for sheltering. However, um, the COVID environment has definitely taught us is to better be prepared and not needed than needed and not have it. So, uh, and, and I think that, you know, everyone can, can pretty much say that it, it's, uh, it's selfish to, to rely on one uh, facility and to cover 21 towns in Northwest Connecticut. So um, I'm gonna have a conversation with Jean and David next week to talk about what that looks like. Now this also, as we go into warming, uh, warming centers, cooling stations, uh, I can send out some guidelines. Rick, I'll send it over to you so that we can get that out to the, uh, the elected officials. Um, this, really, this really talks about warming and cooling stations as well. Um, you know, making sure that we're social distancing, making sure that we have all the PPE and that type of stuff. So from the Red Cross perspective, when we've been talking with the state demos and across Connecticut, the, the idea right now is to really push out to our constituents that people need to shelter in place. People really need to make sure that they're self-prepared and be able to self-sustain. Um, I think that, you know, for, for the long time, we've talked about a 72-hour sustainability, um, you know, post-landfall and what that looks like right now. Obviously, we see with resources in the COVID environment, getting people help after the disaster. So um, last year, we had the macro burst, uh, two years ago, we had the macro burst. Um, I mean, it, it's, we're only, the disasters are continuing to happen more frequently and we really need to push out self-sustainability and relying on your neighbor, checking on your neighbor, uh, and making sure that people have what they need when they need it and where they need it. So my ask to all of you is that we continue to push out the messaging that people need to have a disaster preparedness kit. People need to be able to uh, self-sustain themselves, make sure that they have medications, uh, you know, and, and really the sheltering in a, in a disaster situation is, is a congregate shelter is not the place that people really want to be. I mean, we congregate people, people will die. And, and that's, that's, the, that's no, no soft way to say that. But I mean, looking at what our space has and what we have in the region, um, you know, we really, I, I think that from the perspective that I've been talking with some of the EMDs, um, really what's going to come to the shelter are those people that do not have generator power and have some sort of mobility or functional and access need that, that needs to be sustained, uh, that cannot be sustained at their homes. So really just, you know, the messaging, um, really to, to be prepared uh, to take care of yourselves. I, I know we were a little short on time, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but the final thing that I'll talk about, and as, as, we, as I said on the Long-Term Recovery Committee for Region 5, I really want to push out to the towns as things begin to start reopening businesses, organizations, faith-based groups, and those types of businesses within your community, making sure that those businesses have a continuity of operations plan. The Red Cross has a free program. It's called Ready Rating. It is a free business continuity planning. Uh, it, it's there. There's two versions of it. Um, it takes, uh, I would say, at the most, two hours Per facility to fill this information out, but it builds an emergency action plan. It builds your coup plan. And for all emergency managers out there and chief elected officials, I, I think that we all want to know what all of our businesses and organizations are doing. And this is a free business 
uh, planning tool that some businesses across the or across the United States pay five and upwards of thirty thousand dollars to prepare and build out. So we have this available. It's readyrating.org, and and I'll send out. We did just record a presentation last week that I'll be sending out the YouTube version of that. Uh, I, I just really encourage uh, all, and in, in, in the long run, this will help us all be better prepared for the next incident uh, that comes around. So I'll leave with any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Can you send out uh, the information for how to access that tool? Yes, Rick, can I send it out to you and Janelle and we can get that out to the... Uh, Absolutely. It would be fine, Eric, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions for Eric? Thank you, Don. Thank you, Renford, and everyone. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, next up, we got Marty Connor and John Field. I don't, I don't know who wants to go first, but. Uh, I'll, I'll start off, Don. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll just give you a quick update and then. I'll lead uh, into Marty's conversation on ESF 14 items. But um, uh, we continue to, uh, you know, obviously try to interpret the executive orders that are issued by the governor, um, you know, um, the, and, and the guidelines that they put out. The current one uh, with the school reopening, obviously, the, the, I think the, uh, the state um, education department is actually having a Q&A right as we speak. Um, to try to answer some of those questions and try to provide additional guidelines. I, I will tell you that there's been some questions in regards to providing PPE to and, and other supplies to the schools uh, for their reopening. Um, Demis, at this time, uh, Demis is not providing PPE or other supplies to the schools for the reopening. We're encouraging the school systems to contact the state's uh, education department and work with them um, you know, to uh, basically see what's needed and if they can provide any assistance for what is needed there. Um, some of the other efforts, uh, contact tracing and testing, uh, the state did initiate a uh, process for state uh, testing. Um, CVS site in New Haven has closed. Uh, it was open for about two months, I think. Uh, they did end up closing that. That was the rapid testing uh, site. In New Haven, uh, but they continue trying to monitor all the different testing that goes on in each of the municipalities or um, towns throughout the state. Um, but the state's initiative basically um, started with Bridgeport and Stanford and has been put on hold at them two sites for now. Um, but there is a lot of testing going on. They are trying to continue to enhance the contact tracing um, side of it also. Uh, so there's some efforts there. Another discussion that they're having um, on this is uh, vaccination, trying to develop a vaccination plan for when vaccinations become available. Um, and uh, we continue to work as a region um, from the regional uh, coordination center. We talked about that and um, we currently, I know all the um, local public health currently have uh, pods, points of distribution or mass vaccination sites um, and uh, you know, making sure everybody dusts that off and basically take a look at that for when vaccinations do come available. Um, one of the big things, concerns that's coming up um, pretty quickly here is the uh, stimulus um, monies that was made available through unemployment, uh, that's $600 a week. Um, that will be coming to an end. Um, I believe it's July 25, 20 something. Um, that uh, that uh, stimulus $600 um, a week unemployment will uh, be stopping uh, for people who are unemployed. Um, so we're a little concerned about that and trying to um, identify what needs will be there, remain there if, uh, if that does stop. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to work on that. Uh, we continue to have our um, P PPE pods, points of distribution. Uh, Thursdays, uh, you know, we have our sites in uh, Goshen and Oxford, and on Fridays for EMS and public health, we have our site in Bethlehem. Um, they have advised us that there's an end date of um, August 7th um, for that distribution. So we're, we're starting to uh, work with your EMDs to assure that they 
get what they need into us so that they uh, uh, get all the supplies and PPE needed. Um, we continue to try to address uh, or collect information on food distribution. There's a food uh, group that's meeting, working group. Uh, they're just trying to get um, all the information there is on what food distribution programs are out there so that they can have their arms around that. Uh, you did get some uh, requests for a municipal water authority, uh, appointing a municipal water authority due to the uh, lack of rainfall. Uh, we started to uh, review the drought plan uh, last, last week or the week before. And uh, there was a request to, uh, for each municipality to identify a municipal water authority. Uh, one of the questions that came up on that is, you know, if I don't have, um, you know, public water, you know, and just have wells, do we need that public or municipal water authority? And my answer is yes, uh, because what we're trying to do with the municipal water authority is just have a, a grasp or someone we can contact to talk about um, what your water situation is like in your municipality. So even if you only have wells in your town, um, I think it's important that we have that person that we can talk to about what's the condition of all your wells in your municipality so uh, we know what the, uh, the uh, water supply looks like for our particular state as a whole. We continue to work with the Regional Coordination Center um, and uh, uh, the many, the much support that they've provided the Region 5, Demis Region 5 office. Um, they've done a fantastic job. We're now looking at um, the anticipated uh, surge that, uh, or forecasted surge that people are talking about in the fall, you know, in the fall here. So we're starting to look at some of the after action items that we caught so that we can enhance our operations um, if we have to. Um, so we're continuing to work with that. And then also at the same time, looking at the regional emergency support plan to see how that fits into our particular uh, operation and how things are going there. Um, yesterday, we did have a hurricane preparedness meeting um, to talk about uh, the anticipated uh, hurricane season that's already upon us. And um, you know, included in that was obviously some sheltering conversations. I have reached out to, or we've started the conversation with the EMDs in our region to talk about sheltering in each municipality. Um, Eric talked about this uh, um, a little bit in regards to the regional shelters, but again, at the local, um, opening local shelters, what does that look like um, now that we're in the COVID-19? And um, people were asked to take a look at that and see what we need to do to modify and what the numbers look like. You heard the Torrington Regional Shelter, those numbers, how drastically they've changed based on the restrictions of COVID-19. So um, we've asked each municipality to take a look at their sheltering, their cooling centers, warming centers, um, and see what that looks like when you um, put COVID-19 restrictions into the, uh, the mix. Um, last thing for me, uh, EMPG, we are trying to get back on track with that. Um, so um, if, if you uh, have any EMPG reimbursement requests, please get them into us. We're trying to just get that back uh, into a normal uh, rhythm there. So um, uh, Henry will be working with whoever in your town to assure the EMPG has been uh, um, being put back on track, so to speak. And with that, um, we also have a... Um, uh, a lot of things going on at um, the regional level when it comes to long-term recovery. And I'm gonna let Marty Connor talk about that because there's been a lot going on there. So Marty, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Uh, as the chief said, we've been very busy. Uh, we've stood up the uh, regional steering committee. There are 18 members and we've asked those members then to form individual groups based on their expertise and then form subcommittees. So uh, we're gonna be meeting next week with our steering meeting, uh, with our steering committee. And uh, it looks like we're gonna have a meeting with the faith uh, communities and talk to them about their human services work that they can do and how they can uh, uh, help us all in the, in the region. Um, the chief didn't mention it, but the state has gone out with an RFP to uh, hire some community resource coordinators that will be responsible for 
contract tracing and um, uh, helping folks that have been identified to have COVID-19. Uh, it's so important that we keep them isolated. And if they don't have the ability to uh, get food or uh, other things that they need, or, or even the ability to isolate, uh, we're not gonna stop this. So um, these regional um, community resource coordinators, hopefully will be, I think, working out at John's office uh, to uh, provide assistance. John, can you fill in any more about that? Yeah, so, so these coordinators, I, I don't think they'll be working directly out of our office, but they'll be working out um, closely with Lisa Tupper Bates uh, out of the governor's office to um, assist um, these regional steering committees with identifying what those unmet needs are um, out in the field. So, and one of them being contact tracing and testing and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, yeah, they'll, they'll continue to assist the the regional's efforts and the state's efforts uh, when it comes to identifying what the unmet needs are. So, so yeah, that, so that's that's an, an area that we hadn't really thought we were going to be that involved with, but we will have some involvement. The our long-term steering committee, but we're more looking for um, what the unmet needs are going to be for uh, long-term recovery and. Uh, uh, so that's what our steering committee is really trying to focus more on. So, um, and then the local committees, we've been trying to pass information down to them. So uh, as we get information, we'll try and keep the local committees up to date, or at least the person that's been identified as uh, being in charge of the local committees. Uh, I think that's all I have for today. Yeah, and if I just may jump on that one second, it, and this is why it's so important to have that one contact person for long-term recovery from the municipalities, because that will be our channel of um, communication to the local uh, municipalities. So it's very important that we have that person identified. I know Paul Gibb has been working and trying to collect uh, the names of those uh, contacts for long-term recovery for each municipality. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please um, try to identify a person uh, that we can communicate directly with at the local level for long-term recovery needs. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Anybody have any questions for either Marty or John? It's a quiet group this morning. Okay, next up. Uh, Kim Maxwell talking about Northwest Connect. Can you hear me? And Kim, you know you only have 10 minutes. I'm not, I'm not gonna take that. I'm talking, I'm not gonna talk about COVID, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have and I've written it out, so. But you're back on the East Coast, right? No, no, yes, I am. I'm in Norfolk. I'm in Norfolk, in my house in Norfolk. Um, Norfolk is moving ahead. We're planning on a vote in November. Um, we aren't really prepared for that yet, but we're going to get prepared. Um, we're starting a campaign to start to target specific groups, starting with people in business in Norfolk. We have 162 of them, which we found to our surprise. Um, to help this, we've, we're preparing a business plan. Um, it's going to be a kind of a general idea business plan. Um, it's one that could be used for Norfolk. It's one that could be used for a regional network. Um, it's one that will be usable for getting, trying to get federal funding and state funding. But it's going to be designed in such a way that any other town in the region can modify it easily for their own purposes just by moving some numbers around, presuming that the essential benefits are, are the same. Um, easily adapted and um, the plan does focus, I have to mention COVID-19, um, on the changes that we have brought by COVID-19 uh, in work at home, education at home, and telemedicine. Um, these are gonna be increasing demands. They're of course high now, one of the reasons I think so many calls, so many people are losing it here. But it's gonna sustain itself over the COVID experience when it goes away. And I think it's both a, a problem and an opportunity. Um, people are leaving the big cities 
that probably won't last forever, but I know real estate sales are going up here and we have a chance to do something really good here if we had a superior network. We're working with the staffs of four congressmen, Larson, Hayes, Murphy, and Blumenthal, uh, to promote the idea of getting federal funding for a regional network treated as a pilot for a particular model for doing it. Uh, the staffs have been very cooperative, very interested in doing it, and they've all suggested working with each other. And so we're kind of trying to build a, a coterie, really, of the four, probably adding a couple of more. Uh, the House this week passed an infrastructure bill. Uh, it's 2,300 pages long. If you want to read it, I can send it to you. It's really boring. Um, but it does have a 200-page section on broadband, and it's pretty good. They're planning on... The, the plan, the, the bill has a hundred million dollars for it. And it is not just going to rural, it's going to anybody who doesn't have high quality broadband. So what we're doing actually fits inside the ambit of what they're proposing to do. Um, I am providing a, a, I'm gonna write out a summary of it if anybody would like to have it, just call Jocelyn and she'll let you know. Um, I don't think it's going to pass this year. Uh, I don't think any infrastructure bill is going to pass this year. I could be wrong. Uh, but I think next year, if we have the right people, um, we will end up having an infrastructure bill next year and we could be a part of it, I think. Uh, I'm not certain. Everybody's going to be at it. But we got a good story and we're going to be working on it ahead of time. We're also working with Lamont's office um, in uh, broadband task force that he built in order to deal with the urgent problems of the digital divide. And uh, we've been talking to them now three or four times. Uh, we're putting a business plan together for them that focuses on the benefits of a broadband plan for the state of Connecticut. Again, using us as a pilot because we can get moving very quickly. And um, if things happen in the federal government, what we'll do is ask the state to actually be the applicant rather than us for state funding. Um, while these are going on, uh, we can't avert our eyes from the fact that the only place we really know we can get the money for doing this is here. And uh, Northwest Connect remains committed to trying to find ways of raising money within our communities, starting with Norfolk, uh, principally through taxation which everybody likes, but is very important. It's not a whole lot. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Ben, are you, you're in the, on the call? Is Ben on the call? Uh, earlier. Yes, yes I am, let me. Okay, let me I, Ben, I've, I've said my piece and, and I didn't take 10 minutes. You did a great job, Kim. Don always compliments you when it's under 10 minutes. What, what's going on there? Um, <laughs> all right, guys, a couple of things. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, the other week, two weeks ago, the deployment guide for Northwest Connect was released. Uh, this deployment guide is a tool for municipal municipalities to uh, think through the process of getting from the current status of whatever their connectivity state is to fiber to the home broadband. Um, that document is available either through Northwest Connect or if you were to email me, I can uh, get your group a copy. So that was the first thing I wanted to share is just that um, this document is an available resource for every town. And secondly, uh, the other thing I want to uh, uh, let you guys know is that um, the each town, I would encourage each town, I would ask each town to formally establish a broadband exploratory group. Uh, there are several towns that have done so and actually have made some uh, good headway in progress, but there are a lot of towns that haven't signed up yet. We need that. We need that communication. We need that group active. And when that group becomes either formally established or activated, uh, let me know so that we can start connecting everybody together. Uh, especially with Kim's initiative, having this regional uh, group all looking towards the same common goal it's really important that we have representation from each community who's focused on uh, broadband forward thinking initiatives, and that's uh, a necessary step. So uh, formalize your groups, get them in touch with Northwest Connect and the uh, Northwest Hills Council of Government, uh, let us know, and we can help drive those initiatives forward and take that off a lot of your plates. So thank you.
Any questions on this? I have to admit that both Ben and Kim have been doing very good work on this. They've been plugging right along and there's been some good meetings with the congressional folks and the senatorial folks. So if anybody, those who are interested in pursuing this, we have some good resources available to us, so. Can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> what is the name of this, uh, this group again that, that you formed that you want people for? And how many from each town? So what I'm asking is that each town has a formal uh, representative or group uh, of representatives, um, a committee or commission that is reporting uh, either uh, first selectmen or uh, the responsible agency so that there's a, a single voice coming from each town and in uh, a recognized group that in some ways represents the, um, that level of communication. What I'm seeing happening is random residents of some towns reaching out to me and asking about what's going on in their town and everything like that. Um, and that, that creates a little bit of a disconnect. So if there's a formal establishment that's working on this, um, it's the right way to go. So in, in terms of requirements or requests, um, it's pretty loose. You know, we're all looking for volunteers. So um, if you, uh, you know how that works out. Um, some groups are three people, some groups are eight. Um, I would say uh, if people have the um, bandwidth to work on this and, and if they're um, familiar with some of these topics, that's of course, you know, best case scenario, but um, it's, uh, it'll be a volunteer. A volunteer. Yeah, just, just to briefly clarify, we'd love every town to have a local broadband task force that sort of reports to the Board of Selectmen on their findings and the guidebook that I emailed out to you guys, I think a couple days ago, sort of helps you uh, with that task, with that local task force kind of defining what they would do, um, what their job is and giving them resources to do it. I would, I would actually change the language. I would say instead of we, we would request, we need every town to have one of these groups. Um, especially if we're going to give Litchfield Hills area uh, a, a common voice. It's not going to happen if, if it's just this fractionated thing. So we need each town to have this. Um, also, when it comes time to advocacy, if we can all uh, make common asks, it's just going to be, it's just going to help us all together. Um, any other questions? Barbara? Are you all set? I'm all set, thanks. Anybody else? Um, yes, uh, this is Gary Steinkohl. I'm on the committee in Cornwall. I have a question for Kim and um, Ben. Can you comment on, uh, there's a lot of chatter about Optimum bringing or soon bringing fiber optic to the region. Your thoughts, your impressions? Um, the Optimum, uh, a company that's owned by a French company, Altice, is, uh, has started actually and claims to have an objective of, of fiberizing their network, meaning fiber to the home, replacing coax by 2022. Um, we have not been able to talk to them. I don't know if the probably indolence on our part more than anything else, but they have eight towns in our region. They have another larger set in Fairfield County. The Fairfield County targets are obviously ones they would do. It's not clear they would do us here. Uh, we're so spread out, the costs are gonna be huge compared to the return. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't do it, uh, but um, we don't know for sure that they will. However, if they do it, they will do it only in the towns they serve, the eight of them, and they will probably only connect the people they connect now, which means that for all practical purposes, they're going to provide a superior service for people who have uh, Altice or, in, is it Spectrum or it, well, it's, it, it's, it's Optimum, Optimum. Um, had been, that's, been that's, that's, not, that's not Charter Spectrum. Yeah. Um, so they, they, will, they will update and upgrade the people that they currently serve. Hard to tell if they would actually start expanding beyond that. Um, 
And what we're going to talk to them about when we get a chance to talk to them is whether they'd be willing to partner with us uh, for a regional network where we would provide the background, the backhaul, and poll wiring, and they would compete with everybody of the people in every in the entire region. Uh, that would be a real coup, but we haven't had the conversation with them. And that's, as I say, that's, we have it on a list of things to do. But I think short of anything like that, what will happen is if they upgrade their network here, they will upgrade it for their current customers and not anyone else. The other, the other challenge with Optimum saying this is that this opens the door for them to release a good, better, best offering strategy where uh, that speed will be at a significant premium because they can, they can do that. It's just a standard uh, product play that a lot of these companies will, will roll out there. So um, yeah, it's, it's scary. Like we're hearing this from a, a lot of different companies. If, uh, if you go to Northwest Connect's Facebook page, I posted uh, from the Hartford Business Journal, a release on a Frontier's restructuring plan. Same, same rhetoric. Um, and uh, read read it, read it closely because they choose some interesting language and in how they and how they say they're they're reinvesting in the area. Um, bankrupt companies generally are uh, going to be a little bit more risk averse in how they how they explore new markets. But at any rate, um, yeah, there is chatter that's always going to be happening. It's just the nature of this market. Um, the chatter will probably get louder um, in the next year or two as. The demand for this gets higher so um we're, we're watching all these and and uh do the same let me so, let me just let me just point out that um in every town except torrington in our region the cost of them to pass a home and connect if they only have 50 percent um take rate which was probably what they have 50 to 60 percent take rate now is in the order of eight thousand dollars a home they're not going to recover that very quickly at sixty dollars a month Any other questions for Chamber Ben? All right, uh, next we got Janet Carlson, a couple minutes on the school marketing campaign. Good morning, guys. Um, I will have to talk quickly because I have another meeting coming up, but um, we just got kind of final sign off on everything just this week. So needless to say, we have to be moving quickly. Um, our goal is to get this launched in July, um, hopefully as soon as possible. So next week is gonna be very much heads down. Um, our theme is find your place. So within um, the Northwest corner, you have a lot of options for schools. And what we'll be doing is branding the region and then giving each area its own personality. So you know, our goal is to help uh, the three buckets of people. So they're either New Yorkers that are still in New York, but are thinking about moving, which is a good chunk of people. So you look at approximately 5% of people who are moving normally. Um, obviously, that numbers uh, increase quite significantly. I'm sure many of you have noticed how many New York black uh, license plates are in town. Um, I can tell you that for the first time in 10 years, since uh, my family moved from New York City, um, my street is lit up. The entire street is lit up at night, which is which is pretty exciting. Um, I did have a conversation with the high school principal yesterday, um, who said his his phone is ringing off the hook. Um, he said it's it's really exciting time. So needless to say, they're doing um, you know COVID safe um, tours of their facilities. Um, I will be touching base with each of the school principals, uh, working primarily with the superintendents. Um, but what we'll really be doing is just putting a, you know, a brand on the Northwest corner for the schools and uh, reaching out to, you know, New Yorkers who either are thinking about moving here, New Yorkers who are here and are trying to figure out what to do. Um, a good chunk of them will stay. It's expected between, you know, 10, somewhere between 10 and 20% are going to stay, um, which has significant impact for our towns. And it's really just helping them choose the public schools as opposed to the private schools. I think, you know, as a former New Yorker, uh, my family looked at the schools up here and the, you know, the uh, public schools are absolutely gorgeous. So 
I think when you walk around, look at the schools here, um, all our schools are like private schools. And it's just a matter of finding the right town with, to fit your personality. And as we all know, our, our towns all have their own personalities, which is what makes it so interesting to live here. Um, the next steps, so right now we're in the middle of, you know, working on the branding and the marketing strategy. Um, we'll be working on the landing site and our social media presence. So it'll be really focused on making sure anyone who's looking primarily on Google is able to find us. Um, once they've found us, that they are able to, you know, kind of look at the collective personality and then drill down to figure out kind of where they belong and which, uh, which school they want to talk to. So it's just making it easier to be found. And then once they found us, connect them to the right person so they can get from point A to point B quickly and make the right decision to be in our public schools. Any questions? I have a question. Uh, I, yeah, sure. Barbara Henry, Town of Roxbury, Region 12. Just wanna make sure we are included in that. But I really have a question of how come it's just starting so late? I would have thought that this would have been promoted yeah. well, earlier. Um, there's, this, there's this thing called school boards. Um, if I'd had my druthers, we would have you know, been working on this uh, last November, um, which is really when we started talking about it. So um, school boards have their own timetable. It doesn't necessarily match with mine. Um, so it's, Barbara, I, I think it's just a matter of um, school boards have to go through their process. Um, what I have learned is that when you have an idea, give yourself a year to get it through the, you know, the people that it needs to get to. Um, but the good news is I think we can, you know, certainly mock Chanel and get this done um, because we've been thinking about it. It's, it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not a path we haven't trod before. So we'll be moving quickly. Um, I would be happy to talk to your superintendent. Um, you know, we're, we kind of started with, um, you know, like kind of a small section to get it going, but um, we're happy to have any of the regions that want to participate do so. I thought we voted on this back in November. No, that we would all that we were going with yes. it. Yes. So, uh, you yeah, guys, I, you I would hope you have talked to our superintendent. I can tell you that you know through this COVID, a lot of people have already landed. I mean, our real estate's been bought up, and so it it needs to happen quick because they're going to make a decision to go um, to the private schools. So, well, what I can happen. do is you know the it's already happening. Okay. Well, all I can do is, you know, move when I have sign off. I have sign off, so we're moving quickly. Okay. Understood. Region 12. <laughs> Understood. Thank you, Barbara. And, and if there's any, if there's no other questions, um, I will be happy to come back and, you know, show you what we've done. Um, there, you know, some of you may see it organically. Um, some of you may see it because you're targeted. Um, but I would be happy to share um, what we've done and what the results are done if you'd like to hear about it. Yeah, let's, we don't have a meeting in August, so let's plan on that for September. Okay. Yeah. I'd be to do that. For our September meeting. Okay. Yeah. And I'll bring a, I'll bring a show and tell too. Excellent. All right. Okay. Next discussion is on the census. I don't know. Is that uh, Kevin Shippey or is Owen yes. going to talk about it? Yes. Sir. I'm here. Thank you for the inclusion with the agenda and good morning, everyone. Uh, if the year ends in zero, it's time for the decennial census. And uh, the good news is that the census deadline has actually been extended until Halloween. So right now we're going uh, till the 31st of October. So we're in the thick of things. I oversee the towns, uh, most of the towns in Litchfield County and have been in touch with a lot of uh, the town halls and first selectman's office. Uh, nationally, the rate of response is about 62% uh, for nationally. The state of Connecticut's a little bit better than that. Uh, we're about 65.5%. And Litchfield County is just a click below that, 63.5%. It varies dramatically within the towns uh, within Litchfield, about a 20 point differential. Some are doing extraordinarily well and others are struggling. And in discussions with some of the first selectmen thought that perhaps it could very well be because of the migration from uh, New York City and there's so many uh, secondary homes and 
those who are residing are not their primary residents. And I think that some of that is incumbent upon the census. We haven't done a really great job of communicating the importance. Not only do you need to respond uh, with your personal information for your primary home, but if you are residing in a secondary home, you do need to respond similarly. You would just put zero for the number of residents there. So uh, working with uh, towns, and I've got a, a form I will forward on to Rick uh, for anyone's use. I really think that that's the, that's the ticket, the disconnect uh, for some of the people. Well, I'm a renter, and that really is the landlord's responsibility to respond to that. But if there are uh, residents living there, it is incumbent upon them to respond. Governor Lamont's office uh, issued an initiative this past week. It's, it's kind of an interesting uh, prospect and actually kicks off tomorrow. It's called 10 10 10. At 10 o'clock on the 10th of July, encouraging businesses to take a 10 minute timeout for all their employees and community members to complete the census because that's all it takes. It's the shortest. Uh, census in its form. It's only nine questions. It takes about 10 minutes uh, to complete that. So uh, I'll forward information about that. Uh, but the, the prospect that I wanted to talk about is perhaps, and other counties are doing similarly, it's a census challenge uh, for all of the towns and municipalities, if you might be so inclined, to have a challenge. We could uh, chart response rates and freeze everyone from the same point starting say uh, tomorrow or next week and have a challenge there for the next month and the next 30 days is because after that then come enumerators and knocks on a door and given the environment that we're in now I think the last thing that households want are strangers in a mask coming to knock on their door so ideally you'd like everyone to respond to the census before that but this census challenge would be we would all uh, have a, a competition or bragging rights and there's a tracking uh, website that you can monitor the incremental progress. And if we all threw a gift card in say, and then in 30 days, whomever has the largest incremental increase would have the, the would win those gift cards. I know in other counties they do a hundred dollar gift card. So here it would be, the potential for $2,000 in gift cards, which could be repurposed within your community. So uh, again, I will forward uh, this information and a suggestion about adopting a census challenge. Again, some of the towns who are really overwhelmed with uh, secondary visitors are struggling. Uh, they're more than 15 points behind the state's norm uh, rate. I'm happy to be responsive with any materials. We've got a wealth of uh, information. I know I've stopped off posters and flyers, even with the, the town halls closed and stuck them in drop boxes and happy to respond with anything additionally that you need. So uh, I guess I'll post that to you and forward the information to Rick if you would be so inclined to participate in a census challenge within the, the entirety of Litchfield Hills uh, the Northwest members, if you were inclined to do that. So happy to answer any questions you might have regarding the census or the enumeration and uh, uh, timeline for coming down the home stretch. My one question would be, can you forward to the individual selectmen the percentage of responses in their communities? I will. I will, and then there's a there's a live website you can track in real time. It's one day behind. It refreshes at three o'clock every day that you can see how you've moved the needle. What is that website? Uh, it's pretty. It, it's a long one, but I've got it on this uh, attachment. I'll send on and uh, forward through that along with the seasonal. Yeah, advisory it's hard to find. I, I found it once. I can't find it again. Yeah. Right. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Shippy? I do. Can I ask one more question? You said the second homes, these people also need to fill it out? They do need and, to fill it out. And they, would put, they would respond zero because the, the primary residence would be where they've disclosed all of their uh, personal information. But they do need to respond because that would affect your municipality's response rate and, of course, uh, affect your proportionate funding and distribution of 
federal funds for social service programs. Well, how does that work if it's a, a landlord and the renter are going to both respond for one home? If the landlord does respond, that's fine. But uh, uh, our experience, we're finding that the the it doesn't come to a name; it comes to the address. And so, whomever is living there and brings in the mail may very well be ignoring it. Okay. And one last thing: when are the enumerators starting to go out? Second week in August. They're okay. being trained now, and I know that Don, you were kind enough to allow us a space there for training the trainers there upcoming. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions? Okay, uh, I guess we get to the administrative items next. Um, the first two normally we vote on at the same time would be the minutes and the financial statement. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? I second it. Any uh, corrections or discussion on either of those? I guess everybody can do a thumbs up to vote aye. Either, yeah, either virtual or your thumb. Um, okay, take those down. Anybody opposed? Put me down for an abstention. Dan, you're abstaining? Okay. Anybody else abstaining or anybody else opposed? All right. Um, Rick, you want to talk uh, the next item, which is a couple of letters of support for open space applications? Uh, yeah, just one request, uh, Don, from the town of Sharon, and Brent is online. Brent, can you speak to the request for the open space application for the Von Am farm? Yes, um, this is a ridge line here in Sharon. It abuts uh, Millerton. It's over. Um, it's called Indian Lake. It's one of our most beautiful ridge lines. It's within our um, town plan to protect these types of ridge lands. It's an old farm. It's a functioning farm. It can remain a functioning farm heading into the future for future generations. And um, the land trust has been doing a great job here in not only uh, obtaining lands, but also making them available for our, our public and, and others around the region for hiking and things of that nature. So that's why it's important to us. Are there any questions or comments? If not, I guess we would need a motion to. I'll so move. Second. I'll second it. Who seconded Curtis? Yep. Uh, All right. Any other discussion? All in favor? We'll do the. <laughs> All right. <laughs> any opposed or any abstentions? All right. Um, next item, we need a. Motion to add an item to the agenda, the, which is to discuss the hazardous waste day contract. We have a motion to put that on the agenda. So moved. That was Henry, second. Maggie, is that you seconding? I'll second it, even okay. though it doesn't Marvel involve me. I did, sorry about that. I'm having problems getting rid of the reactions off of there. Okay, well, Barbara seconded Rick, the reason you wanted to vote on this is because we had a contract in place and you need authority to cancel that contract? Yes, and I'll let uh, Curtis elaborate as the chairman of the Recycling Advisory Committee. Uh, regarding this earlier, anything else you want to add, Curtis? No, not really. I just, you know, we're, we're worried about COVID. We're worried about uh, concentrated people for four hours or five hours uh, all jammed up together in a parking lot. So first we need a vote to add this to the agenda. It's already been moved and seconded. I should have the vote before we discussed it. So all in favor? Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? And now we need a motion to approve the cancellation. Is there a motion? I'll move it again. Okay, is there I'll a second to that? Who is the second? I'll second it. Got it. Okay. I think we have the discussion ready. All in favor of cancellation? Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then there's only one more item. Uh, Rick and I talked. There's no reason this year we can't have our annual golf outing, even though- Wait, Don, 
the Don, member. Excuse me, uh, excuse me, Don, can I back up just a bit? Uh, because in addition to the August 22nd uh, household hazardous waste day, there's also one scheduled uh, in the city of Torrington for October. I think we can wait until our September meeting to take action on that. Uh, but I did want to mention that some of the RAC members felt that we should just cancel both events right now. But uh, the motion was to just um, just made and seconded and voted on was to just uh, cancel the one for next month. Uh, but I did want to mention that we can act on that separately at our September. I agree we can wait until September to act on that one to see what the situation is when we get closer to it. Okay, good. All right, so then the question is, should we schedule a golf outing in August on the day when we normally have our meetings since there's no meeting because golf is one of the activities that is still quite allowable. Um, the rules have changed a little bit, but it's still basically golf. So is there interest in having a golf outing? We might even invite Leo back for that. I think that's affirmative. <laughs> then we should invite him or we should have it. Or both. All right, Rick, why don't you send out an email to everybody and see if we can get a head count on people who would be interested in participating. The thought was we could do it on August 12th, which is when we would normally have a meeting, but we normally can't sell our August meeting. So I don't think we need a motion on that, but Rick, why don't you, you know, see what kind of interest there is? Sure, will do, thank you. Then it says any other business or a motion to adjourn would be also entertained. Anything else? Oh, that was quick, Barbara. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second that. And Maggie, you, I think Maggie beat you to that one, Charlie. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Everybody uh, Aye. stay healthy and enjoy your summer. And hopefully we'll see some of you at a golf outing. If not, we'll see everybody in September. But stay healthy is the main thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Everyone. Thanks.